Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our debts. As we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and his, the power. For yours is the kingdom and the power. And the power. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 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 Welcome to Community Online. My name is Tammy Melchine, and I'm so glad you're with us today as we join together to celebrate God and how he's at work in our lives and in our world. I'm confident that God wants to use this time to both encourage and challenge us to take next steps in our spiritual journey with him. As we begin, let me remind you of a few things. First, I'd love for you to invite others to this experience. You can do that by sharing this link via Facebook, Twitter, or by sending an email. If you're watching us on Facebook or communityonline.tv, Use the links provided to invite a friend, a family member, maybe a neighbor or coworker. Since we're online, you can invite anyone from anywhere in the world. I've actually had relatives from Ohio, Florida, and Virginia join us here for services, and they've expressed how much encouragement they found here. For those of you who are brand new to community, let me say a special welcome. We are so glad you found us online. In fact, we'd love for you to fill out our communication card so we can get to know you. You can find it on our app or by texting the word CONTACT to 313131 or by simply clicking the banner below. We'd love to hear from you. Also, if you were with us for the pre-service, you got to meet several members of our prayer team. Our prayer team is available right now to pray for you during this service. So many of us are facing challenges, and I want you to know that you don't have to face them alone. Simply click the prayer button below or text the word PRAY to 630-793-6399, and someone from our prayer team will respond. All right, here at Community, we love STUCO, our student community for middle school and high school students. Let me hand things off to Bobby Klinker, our Naperville Student Community Director, who is going to introduce a special part of our service. Hey community, my name is Bobby Klinker, and I get to serve as one of the Stuco directors at our Naperville location. Some of you might have heard that word Stuco before, or maybe you've read it somewhere and wondered what in the world does that actually mean? Well, Stuco is short for student community, and it represents just that. It's a place where sixth through 12th grade students can come be themselves, can build friendships, and also develop and cultivate a relationship with Jesus. Now, typically, we meet and gather at our locations for Stuco, but during this season, we've all moved online. And we do services every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, and those services can be found in three different spots. Right now, we are broadcasting live to Instagram, to YouTube, and also to Facebook in our Stuco online Facebook group. If you have a student, we would love for them to be part of what's happening with Stuco. And as a parent, we'd love to encourage you to join that Facebook group specifically designed for parents to build community, to get specific resources, and also just a place where you can view the services as well. Now, I've been incredibly proud of how our Stuco staff team has responded during the season. And I've been even more blown away by the response of our students. I just want to give you a quick example. Just a couple weeks ago, three members from our staff team, uh, Victor from Aurora, Evelyn from Naperville, 
and Alini from Plainfield got together and they decided they were going to figure out how to enable students to continue leading musical worship for Stucco, even though we were online. Now, if you've ever been to a Stucco service at a location before, you know that students lead music every week. But it's extra challenging to make that happen online. But they came up with the plan, and last week was the first chance that we got to see it in action, and it was awesome. And it's, it's honestly, it's been humbling and encouraging to see students leading in that way. And I'm so grateful that you also get to experience some of that as well. I'm always so encouraged seeing our students sing and worship God. 
I'm grateful that when I was a teenager, I had a church community that loved me and helped me take next steps with Jesus. And come to think of it, I'm still so grateful that I have that now. Here at Community, our mission is to help people find their way back to God and to encourage and challenge one another to grow as 3C Christ followers. People who gather together to celebrate God, who connect with one another through small groups, and who join together to contribute to the world. It's our ongoing generosity that moves this mission forward. So I want to encourage you right now to join us in furthering the mission by giving back to God. If every person celebrating with us today were to give something, no matter the amount, it will result in more students, more adults, and more kids finding their way back to God. So right now, click the Give button or text the word Giving Back to 313131 or go to the Community app. You can also mail your check to our address in Naperville. Let's generously give back to God. While you're doing that, I have a special announcement to share with you. If you've been a part of community for a while, you know how impactful community music has always been for us as a church, even more so during this season. But what you may not know is that community music's impact is being felt across the country and the world. During this pandemic, many other churches have shared and sung community music songs, most notably the song, Make Room. Here is where I lay it down Every burden, every crown This is my surrender This is my surrender Aos teus pés abandonar O meu crer, meu duvidar Eis a minha entrega In fact, this past Friday, a brand new recording of that song was released by Word Worship Music as the first single from their new collection called The Church Will Sing, Volume 2. It's available right now wherever you stream music, so make sure you check that out soon. Well, today we are continuing in our series, Pray Like This. Last week, we kicked off the series by learning to pray the prayer of adoration, to come to the Father to give Him praise and thanks. Hopefully you were able to practice adoration this past week using the scriptures and prompts in our community Bible reading plan. Today, we're going to learn about another form of prayer. So let's join teaching pastor Ian Simpkins for week two in Pray Like This. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead, and lead us, us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For, For yours, yours is the kingdom, kingdom, kingdom and, and the power, and the, and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen. Hey everyone, welcome to Community Online. My name is Ian Simpkins, and I am absolutely thrilled to be with you today. Before we open in prayer, uh, I'd love for you to write two things in the comments. One. Where are you joining us from? And two, what are you grateful for this week? I feel like there's a lot of negativity in the news and media. Just type in the comments below, what are you grateful for this week? And with that, let me pray for us, and then we'll dive right in. God, I am so grateful that wherever we're joining from, that you are in our midst right here and now, God. Open our eyes to that reality. Speak to us, move in and through us today, God. And we give you all the praise and glory. And everybody said... Amen. Uh, I'm wondering, have you ever said something that you, you didn't actually mean? 
Like, not like you pretended to enjoy a Vin Diesel movie or something, but like, have you ever just out of politeness said something that in hindsight, you're like, I don't, I don't think that was actually true. Like, I feel like right now, everyone's asking, oh, hey, how are you? How are you doing? And I find that a lot of people end up saying something like this. Great. Has anyone in the last month responded great when they actually <laughs> weren't great? Or how about this next one? Has anyone ever said this one? No, it's fine. Anyone in the last month or so said, no, it's fine? Maybe more importantly, has anyone heard, no, it's fine? If your significant other told you, no, it's fine, uh, there should be like sirens going off in your head somewhere. Another one that's kind of a pet peeve in my family is this word right here. This word means actually, literally. And I feel like more and more, I keep hearing people say things like, oh, that literally blew my mind. You're like, no, it literally didn't. Your misuse of literally is making me figuratively insane. Like we often say stuff that we, we just don't, we don't actually mean. And sometimes it's not just simply stuff that we, we don't actually mean. For example, I've been trying to read more of the news lately, and I read that in April that the Dow lost 288 points. And I can't tell you how frustrating it is to not actually know what that means. I, it's just so... <laughs> Sometimes we say stuff we don't really mean, but other times we say stuff that we don't know the meaning of. And the part of the Lord's Prayer that I want to talk about today, I think can sometimes fit into both of those categories. We're in week two of a series we're calling Pray Like This, and we're following line by line each line of what's called the Lord's Prayer. In fact, what I love about the intro to this prayer is that Jesus' disciples, his apprentices, have been following him, ministering with him, watching him do miraculous things, and they make this very interesting request. They say this to Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, I don't know about you, but that might not have been the first thing that I ask if I were them. Like, I, I'd be more inclined to ask, like, Lord, show us the walking on water thing. That was incredible. Or show us the the whole multiplying food thing. But the disciples understood something that I think is easy for us to miss. They understood that prayer was absolutely central to the ministry of Jesus. And so after watching him and ministering with him, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus then responded with what's been called centuries later as the Our Father or the Lord's Prayer. In fact, I would love for us to not just simply read this, but to actually say this aloud together. You ready? Let's say this aloud together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. A lot of us are perhaps familiar with that phrase or that prayer, but we've been diving in each line week by week to see if we can't better understand this prayer that Jesus himself taught his disciples. Last week we talked about this word adoration, C coming to God, not requesting anything, but just simply praising him for who he is. And today I want to focus on the second line of the prayer. And the second line of the prayer reads, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And the idea that I want to talk about today is this idea of intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer is a word that maybe some of you are familiar with, but others of you, maybe you conjure an image of like a slick-haired televangelist or something. Intercession is simply the act of intervening on someone else's behalf. In fact, in the Hebrew, the word intercede or intercessory is the word paga, which simply means to meet. When we intercede, we meet with God. And, and more pointedly, we meet with God on behalf of other people. It's sort of like going to your kid's school and meeting with your kid's teacher because there's been a problem in the classroom. Intercession, intercessory prayer is simply meeting with God. Now, I think a lot of us probably do that without actually realizing that we do that. Or, or maybe we do it, but we, we don't actually have a word for it. In fact, Lifeway conducted a poll just a couple of years ago, and here's what they found about our prayer habits. Found that 82% when we pray for families and friends, 82% of the time we're praying for family and friends. 37% of the time we pray for our enemies, which was actually 
much higher than I anticipated. And then just 13% of the time we pray for our sports teams to win, which would explain some of the current circumstances here in Chicago. I'd be curious, type in the comment section below, what, what kind of stuff do you find yourself praying for? What, what tends to sort of occupy your mind, your heart, your soul? What, what things have you prayed for? Or maybe even write down below, what are you praying for right now? What's weighing heavily on your heart? But here's the thing, intercessory prayer is asking God to bring his kingdom right here on earth, to bring his kingdom into situations and in communities and systems and people where it isn't actually being done yet. It's asking God to make right, which is currently not right. In fact, there's a, uh, a Quaker author and theologian that I've loved for a long time, and he, he put it this way. He says, if we truly love people, we will desire for them far more than it is within our power to give them, and this will lead us to prayer. Intercession is a way of loving others. I, I love that picture. See, if we really love people, deep in our core, we will desire for them more than what we can give them ourselves, and it should lead us then to this idea of intercessory prayer, to intercede on behalf. And in this prayer, we pray, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done, not my kingdom, not my will. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we pray this because God's kingdom is not fully present here yet. His kingdom is what we would call both a now and not yet. It's both now and not yet. In fact, we asked a good friend of community named Alex Absalom to explain that idea just a little bit further. Take a look. So Alex Absalom has been a friend and ministry partner to community for a ton of years. He and his wife lead a ministry called Dandelion Resourcing that seeks to empower disciple-making leaders. And the Absaloms have actually led several training sessions for our staff over the years. So you, you helped our team understand a little bit about the kingdom of God by talking about this idea of the now and not yet. Could, could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, so... Um... A good way to analogy, uh, imagine it, sorry, is with an image. And so where you'd start with uh, the beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, Adam and Eve are there in the Garden of Eden. They're super happy doing this great uh, full-on relationship with God. There's no barriers between them and God. The kingdom is fully present wherever they are because they have no barriers between them and God. Uh, and then the Bible tells us Genesis 3, this disaster happens, the full is what the Bible calls it, where they choose to rebel from God and his rule. And because of sin, that creates this divide, this huge gap between them and God. They feel separated and shut out from God's kingdom. And that's where things like sin, obviously, and death and evil and sickness enter mm -hmm. the equation. It's worth us remembering at a time like this with coronavirus that that does not come from God. That's not part of God's original design. Mm -hmm. God hates things like that. God, for instance, hates cancer far more than we do yeah. uh, and, and so this experience we have in this world is not how God originally set it up now as we go through the Bible what we see particularly in the Old Testament is the kingdom appears at, at points so it might be Moses in the burning bush or it might be uh, Ruth where she says to Naomi your God will be my God or it might be Daniel in the lion's den these moments where the presence and the power of the kingdom breaks out but the problem is for us here on earth it feels almost random or there's not a continuous experience of the presence of God but then that all changes with the most momentous uh, time in history which is when Jesus comes and we represent this on the chart with the cross uh, and through Jesus's life death ministry resurrection uh, and ascension that's where uh, we see the the breakthrough again of God's kingdom so the words from Jesus's lips repeatedly are the kingdom is at hand the kingdom is breaking in into the here and now he allows us afresh to start to experience God's kingdom which is an eternal perspective that's what we look forward to in heaven but we get to experience it in the here and now today we see God's kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven and that's going to go forward until Jesus comes again. So it's, we're now looking forward to the future. Uh, we believe that Jesus is, is, means it when he says he's going to return and that we will be forever fully part of God's kingdom where the Bible tells us that there is no more tears and sickness and death and evil. All those things are completely eradicated. But what that means is right now we're stuck in this 
in between time where the kingdom is advancing. So every time we pray for a sick person, every time we share about Jesus, every time we're generous with our possessions, Mm. we see the kingdom advance. But also there's a battle because the enemy, even though he knows he's lost, is ultimately defeated. He's fighting uh, a vicious, ruthless fight to try and tear down and and to destroy. And Mm. so we're in this conflict zone uh, where the kingdom is both present, but it's also not yet here. And sometimes we find ourselves more on the present side. Sometimes we find ourselves stuck in situations where the kingdom doesn't seem to be here yet. Alex, we're, we're so grateful for you and for Hannah and for your ministry. Thank you so much for taking the time to, to pour into our church. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. See, I love Alex's wisdom there. And this idea of praying God's kingdom come to earth is what we do when we intercede on behalf of each other. In fact, there's numerous stories throughout scriptures, particularly the New Testament of God's people interceding on behalf of others. And one in particular that I wanna unpack is in Acts chapter 12. So here's the scene. Uh, James, who was sort of in Jesus's inner circle, has been executed. In fact, after that execution, King King Herod's uh, popularity sort of skyrockets, and now they have Peter in custody, who's another close friend of Jesus, and word on the street is that he's gonna be executed the very next day. So God's people, the church, the family of God, gather to intercede on Peter's behalf. And here's what happens in Acts chapter 12. It says, so Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up quick. Get up, he said, and the chains fell off of Peter's wrists. I want us first just to enter the story a little bit. Imagine that you're Peter. You don't even necessarily know that the church is praying for you and you're awaiting your trial the next day where you're pretty sure you're gonna be executed. And then this scene happens and here's what happens next. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes, which is a, it's a good note there, and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and then they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. I love that the Bible includes the note that Peter wasn't even really sure this was happening. I mean, can you blame him? Like, the scene is so wacky. He's sort of wondering, like, this is a really trippy dream. I shouldn't have had that second bowl of chili last night. See, it includes even the humanness of him not being sure what's happening there. And then here's what happens next. Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. So he sort of comes to. So this wild scene happens. The angel leaves him. And Peter eventually says, well, I guess this is legitimate. I guess this is really what's happening. So Peter then goes to the house of Mary where everyone is praying. And then in verse 13, here's what we see what happens. It says, Peter knocked at the outer entrance and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. So poor Rhoda in all of this, by the way, she, she encounters Peter, is so excited that she forgets to even open the gate, runs back to tell everyone the good news, the thing that they were praying for, by the way. And what do they tell her? Nah, you're out of your mind. You're out of your mind. At best, it's his angel. And then the story concludes here in verse 16. But Peter kept on knocking and knocking and knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Now, I love this story for so many reasons. But one of the main reasons I love this story is that it it shows the raw humanness of the whole exchange. Right? Like if you were making up a story about how God was redeeming and rescuing the world, would you include a story like this where the The people are literally praying for one thing to happen. It happens, and they don't even believe it. Like, that's an aspect of spiritual journeying that I feel like I really relate to. Have you ever been in that place before? Where you're praying for one thing, but you doubt that God will actually do anything about it. Or you're fervently 
requesting something of him, but you, you wonder if he really even hears you. In fact, there's a, a scholar named N.T. Wright, and he writes about Luke, who's the author of Acts, and this passage in particular, and here's what he says. He says, Luke is allowing us to see the early church for a moment, not as a bunch of great heroes and heroines of the faith, but as the same kind of muddled, half-believing, faith one minute and doubt the next sort of people as most Christians we all know. I love that. Does anyone else find that to be true? There are moments where we feel like we're riding high and we're on the mountaintop, but there are also moments, myself included, where we struggle to actually believe that God will intervene. But time and time and time again throughout Scripture, we see that when people intercede, God intervenes. Not always and not always the way that we want or plan or hope for, but he hears our prayers. I love the humanness of this story because it shows, I think, a reality that a lot of us have experienced. Wanting so badly to believe, but struggling to actually believe it. Pleading with God, but wondering if he actually hears us. These first century Christians lived, prayed, and trusted God with an imperfect faith, just like us. Sometimes we struggle to believe, but that does not mean that the invitation to intercede, to pray that God's kingdom would come to earth ceases. He still, with all of our mess and our scars and our wounds, invites us to step into that. So I want to give us just four quick suggestions for how to actually do that. How do we actually intercede on behalf of those around us or the world? And I want to offer a couple of suggestions that I hope will be helpful. And if you're a note-taking type, you might want to write these down. Um, and these come from a pastor named Peter Gregg. He, he, he's written a number of really wonderful books and sermons about this idea of intercessory prayer. And the, the first thing he mentions is to get inspired. Get inspired. Engage with God's words. Scripture is actually filled with promises that we can remember and we can claim as we pray. In fact, one of my favorites comes from 2 Corinthians. And it reads, Whatever God has promised gets stamped with the yes of Jesus. In him, this is what we preach and pray. The great amen. God's yes and our yes together, gloriously evident. In fact, you can just hop on Google and literally type intercessory prayers or promises of God. I, I'm not ashamed to admit that I've done that numerous times when my faith feels like it's treading water. Scripture is filled with these promises that we can remember, we can recite, we can memorize, and we can claim. Man, my yes and God's yes gloriously evident. We can engage God's word and ask God, would you fulfill your promises in this world? Second thing is to get informed. Get informed, engage with the facts. This one maybe seems obvious, but it's really, it's actually quite easy to miss. It's really important, whether it's a friend or talking about a systemic issue, to get informed, find out the facts, do the research, figure out what's actually legitimate and what maybe isn't. Get informed, find out the facts about the problem that you want to address. The third is to get indignant. Now, you maybe not. I've not heard that in a sermon necessarily, but I think that that's actually really important. Sometimes people assume that like getting angry is not a Christian trait, but scripture says just don't sin in your anger. But if we look at the world, there are things that we should look at, injustice, exploitation of the marginalized. We should step back and say, no, that's, that's angry. I'm angry about that. That's not right. In fact, if you remember Alex's illustration here, if, if we know what the kingdom of God is to be and we look at this in-between space where God's will is not being lived out, where his kingdom is not fully present, that should create in us some kind of indignation, some, some kind of righteous anger that people are being exploited and marginalized, that the vulnerable are being taken advantage of. In fact, there's a, a theologian and an activist named Walter Wink, and I, I think he puts it best. He says, intercessory prayer is spiritual defiance of what is in the way of God, of what God has promised. It's spiritual defiance. It's stepping back and saying, that's not God's will. That's not his kingdom come. That, that's not the heart of the Father. We, when we engage not only with his word, but with the problems of the world, it should stir in us some kind of indignation. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, every verb in the Lord's Prayer in the Greek is what's in called the imperative mood, which means it's like forceful. It's assertive. Like it's got some teeth to it. 
It requires some movement from us. When we intercede, our hearts should be stirred. And then fourthly, get in sync. Get in sync. Engage with others. In fact, one of the gospel writers, a guy named Matthew, he wrote this, and he's talking about a church dispute specifically, but he says, and many of you are familiar with this verse, if two or three of you come together as a community and discern clearly about anything, my Father in heaven will bless that discernment. For when two or three gather together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. And I think that applies not only for the church discipline that he's talking about in that original context, but also here and now. What does it look like for us to engage together as the body of Christ, to engage together? There's unique power when we come together, even digitally, to pray, to intercede on behalf of others. In fact, even that word amen, so often the word amen is sort of like a nice, polite way to end a prayer. What the word amen actually means is so be it. May it be so. When we're saying amen, it's saying, yes, God, that's what I want in my life, in my family, in the world, where there's hurt, where there's pain, where there's darkness. Yes, God. That's the important part of intercessory prayer. It's not just how we conclude this prayer. It's asking God to, to move, but to also move through us. It's us and God, hand in hand, prayer and action go together. I love the way that N.T. Wright puts it again. He says, we are praying for the redemption of the world, for the radical defeat and uprooting of evil, and for heaven and earth to be married at last, for God to be all and in all. And if we pray this way, we must be prepared to live this way. We can only pray this prayer for the church if we are prepared to mean make us kingdom bearers. Make us kingdom bearers is what it means to pray your kingdom come, your will be done. It's not just passively, God, let me know when it's completed. If you could go ahead and fix this issue or intervene over there and saying, God, how can I join you in the work? of bringing hope and healing to a hurting world. That's what it means to be kingdom bearers, to not just simply pray a prayer, but to be prepared to move, to be his hands and feet. And one of the most powerful ways that I've ever seen a church do this is through our Community Cares Initiative. And many of you are familiar, we've identified the 11 greatest needs in and around our community, and we've now mobilized 11 different teams to care for the people in our communities, in our cities, right where they're at. And I have just a whole list of stories, but I want to read just a couple of them for you so you get a glimpse, a picture, a vision of the kinds of impact that God is having through our church, through our Community Cares Initiative. One story says this. It says, I don't know if I've ever gotten back to you about how helpful community has been to our organization. On March 26, we began sourcing food and putting together bags of groceries for seniors. We needed help delivering those packages so seniors could stay in their residence and not risk exposure. Our case managers doing well-being checks discovered seniors who had not eaten in two or three days. Community contacted us and supplied drivers for our delivery efforts. My Monday small group all showed up to help with deliveries many times in the past week. Community folks are doing so much more than we ever realized. What an awesome God and awesome people. And to this point, we have delivered groceries to over 1,400 seniors and made more than 4,000 well-being calls. That's interceding. That's bringing the kingdom of God here and now. The second story is an email that we got that reads this. My teenage daughter and I became homeless before the epidemic began. After traveling around for months to different hotels, living in our car and using shelters, we finally got a break when the county received funding to help us with a hotel room in Yorkville. Unfortunately, I've yet to find a job. My car needs some pretty big repairs, and I'm running low on gas and money for everyday necessities and clothes. My daughter is a freshman and has finally started to catch up with her schoolwork and is doing well, and we just found a foster mom for our two cats. It was a blessing to see your email. We could use any help and support that you could possibly give. And then there was a really generous uh, Yorkville member that sent some gift cards, and we connected them with a couple of our community cares teams, and then they wrote back and said, I just got the cards, and please thank the donor for their generosity. It will help us so much. I can't thank you enough. I also spoke with Elizabeth from Community Cares this afternoon and we'll be making a trip to the Yellow Box on Thursday. This community is truly amazing. And I just want to say, community, thank you. Thank you for stepping up in the ways that you have, for being kingdom bearers, for interceding on behalf of the people who so desperately need hope and, and life 
and light and love and care. We are a part of that. And if you have not yet joined a Community Cares team, I cannot encourage you enough to do so. Go to communitychristian.org slash cares. You can check out all the different teams, all the different efforts. There is a place for you. This, let's be kingdom bearer. Let's be hands and feet of Jesus in this space, in the here and now. When we look at the world, there are so many places where God's will is not being done. And Jesus saw these places too. And that's why he prayed this prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, I think N.T. Wright, not surprisingly, put it best. He said, Jesus is the musical genius who wrote the greatest oratory of all time. And we are the musicians captivated by his composition ourselves who now perform it before a world of music and cacophony. The kingdom did indeed come with Jesus, but it will fully come when the whole creation finally joins in this song. But it must be Jesus' music. And the only way to be sure of that is to pray his prayer. Friends, my sincere hope is that wherever we're at, wherever God has placed us, that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus, that people would encounter him when they encounter us, that we would pray these prayers to be light in dark places, to bring hope where there is despair, to bring justice where there is injustice, to bring love where there is fear. Let's pray together, God. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And let's invite all of creation to join in the song. Let's pray. God, thank you for inviting us into your work of helping people find the way back to you. That you would allow us to in any way join you, God, is a miracle. Help us to pray this prayer. Not our kingdom, not our will, but yours, God. To bring your kingdom to earth in whatever ways that you've equipped us, God, wherever you've placed us. We pray this today and every day, God. I ask that you would strengthen us to do it. We thank you and we love you. And we pray all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Now, we're going to celebrate communion together a little bit differently than we have in the past. In fact, uh, I would encourage you right now, wherever you're at, to go get something to eat and something to drink because we're going to celebrate communion together in just a couple of moments. And just hours before Jesus' crucifixion, he's not performing one more miracle or giving one more sermon. What he's doing, he's, he's sharing a meal. He's sharing a meal with his closest friends. And he says, in a world that takes, I invite you to receive. Jesus is often saying to his followers, my people live differently. And so we're going to celebrate just a little bit differently today. It's, it's one thing, I think, to simply listen to someone else pray, maybe the way that we did just now. It's something else entirely, though, for us to actually hear our own voices, to intercede together. So what I want to do is I, I want to actually walk us through a number of intercessory prayers. And I would encourage you, wherever you're at, maybe turn the phone off, get away from any other distractions. I want you to actually respond out loud together. I'll pray the prayer, and then you'll respond with, listen to our prayer. And I want to encourage you to actually say it out loud. Hear your voice. Is it confident? Is it fearful? Is it worried? Is it bold? Whatever it is, li listen to your own voice, praying to God on behalf of others. Lord, listen to our prayer. And then after we pray this prayer, there'll be some instructions on the screen for how to actually receive communion together. So let's pray these prayers together. Let's intercede on behalf so that God's kingdom would come to earth. Let's pray this together. Oh God, our healer, show your compassion for all of humanity that is in turmoil and burdened with illness and with fear. Hear our cry, oh God. Listen to our prayer. Come to our aid as this virus spreads globally. Heal those who are sick. Support and protect their families and friends from being infected. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Grant us your spirit of love and self-discipline so that we may come together working to control and eliminate this virus. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Make us vigilant 
attentive and proactive in the eradication of all diseases that create suffering for many people. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Heal our self-centeredness and indifference that makes us worry only when things threaten us. Open ways beyond timidity and fear that too easily ignore our neighbor. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Strengthen and encourage those in public health services and in the medical profession. Caregivers, nurses, attendants, doctors, all who commit themselves to caring for the sick and their families. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Inspire, give insight and hope to all researchers focused on developing a vaccine. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Sustain all workers and business owners who suffer loss of livelihood due to shutdowns, quarantines, closed borders, and other restrictions. Protect and guard all those who must travel. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Guide the leaders of the nations that they speak the truth, halt the spread of misinformation, and act with justice so that all may know healing. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Heal our world. Heal our bodies. Strengthen our hearts and our minds, and in the midst of turmoil, give us hope and peace. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Hold in your embrace all who have died and who will die. Comfort their loved ones in their despair. Hear our cry, O oh God. Listen to our prayer. Remember all your family, the entire human race, and all your creation in your love. Amen.
is broken, truth will undo Lies that were spoken when heaven breaks through Joy overwhelming, all this may do Death is defeated when heaven breaks through All fear is broken, truth will undo Lies that were spoken Friends, this season has been challenging, but I pray that God would open all of our eyes to see the ways that heaven is breaking through. May his kingdom come, may his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm looking forward to practicing the prayer of intercession this week through the community Bible reading plan. I hope you'll join me in that. You can find more information and sign up at communitychristian.org online. On that site, you can also find information on connecting in a small group, contributing through our Community Cares Ministry, and links to our Kid City and Student Community online programming. And don't forget, if you are new to community, we would love for you to fill out our communication card before you go so that we can learn your name and welcome you to our church family. You can find it on our app or by texting CONTACT to 313131 or by simply clicking the banner below. Thank you for celebrating with us today. I hope you are leaving encouraged and challenged to grow in your journey with Jesus. And I hope to see you back here at Community Online next Sunday for week three of Pray Like This.